Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's talk on Augustus and the Imperial Image by Dr. Christopher Burden Strevens from the University of Kent. Um, I'm Stephanie McLaughlin, and I'm chair of the Guildford Classical Association. I'd like to welcome members from the Southampton and LSA uh, Classical Associations, as well as teachers and pupils from across the UK, and of course, our GCA members. Um, I shall soon pass over to Christopher, but before I do so, there are just a few technical announcements that I wanted to make. Um, you as the audience can't be seen or heard, but you can ask the speaker questions for the Q&A at the end. And you can do that at any time just by typing into the Q&A section. Um, if you require any technical help uh, or you'd like to raise other queries with the panellists, then please do so by using the chat button. Um, I hope you will enjoy this talk as much as I'm excited to hear it. Uh, so, Dr. Burden Strevens, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Steph, for these words of introduction. And it's a delight to be joining the Guildford Classical Association this evening, uh, this august institution. And august is indeed the operative word on this chilly November evening, because the focus of my talk today is the Emperor Augustus, who reigned in Rome from 27 BC up to 14 AD, and he oversaw the transformation in Rome from being a republic to a monarchy. Now, I'll just open up my slides. There we are. Now then, where do we begin with Augustus and the imperial image? And how can we use Augustus's image or images as a way of understanding his success? Now, as Steph was already saying, if you have any questions or thoughts that you want to raise during the Q&A at the end, please pop those into the Q&A box. If we were in a lecture theatre at my university, I would be asking you to put your hands up whenever something comes up that you want to talk about, because it's like a light bulb going off in your head and we need to jump on those moments. So please, anything that comes up while I'm talking, anything you want to talk, out, talk about more or hear more about, pop it into the Q&A and I'll come to you at the end. Now, I want to take you back to 14 AD. The Emperor Augustus has been on the throne for 40 years and he has died. You leave your house, the pub, uh, the Roman Forum, whatever temple you're in, and you walk up to the Campus Martius, to the plains of Mars, the field of Mars, just outside of the sacred boundary of the city of Rome itself. You're making this journey because you want to pay homage to the Emperor Augustus. You want to visit the site of his great mausoleum and pay your respects to the corpse of Rome's first emperor. Now, on your way up there, you're going to see two things. First, you're going to see two enormous bronze pillars at the entrance of the Emperor Augustus' mausoleum. And these are inscribed with the words of the emperor himself. We know this text today as the Reis Gestae. The Reis Gestae is an account of Augustus's achievements that he wrote shortly before his death, perhaps a few years prior to his death. And it's a record of his services to the Senate and people of Rome. On your way into the mausoleum, you stop to read this. And the first thing that grabs your attention is that the word Reis Publica Republic is in the very first line of Augustus Reis Gestae, of Augustus' record of his achievements that's on those bronze pillars. And you read on, and the word Republic, Reis Publica, keeps coming up again and again. And I've marked on your screen in red some instances in the inscription where this happens. You read on, and you encounter another thing. You note that the Emperor Augustus, in his record of his life's achievements, keeps on talking about the Senate, and he keeps on talking about the Senate's decrees, decrevit senatus, and I've marked some instances of this for you in purple on the inscription. And you walk away from this, you walk past the bronze pillars, and you think, my goodness, Augustus may have been our leading citizen, but he worked hard to work with the Senate. He cared about the Republic. He's always talking about the Republic and about the Senate. He is the essence of a constitutional monarch. But then you proceed past these bronze pillars toward the mausoleum itself, and you're overawed by its scale. The remains of Augustus' mausoleum still stand today in the city of Rome, and in the last year they've been opened once again for the public to visit. 
Augustus' mausoleum is a giant rotunda built out of concrete and then faced with huge slabs of marble. It gleams, it glitters white. And on top of the rotunda, no longer surviving now, sadly, there's a vast ornamental garden shaped into a cone with cypress trees planted around it. And topping that garden is a gold statue of the Emperor Augustus himself. These are two very different Augustuses. On the raised gestae, on the bronze columns, with Augustus's own words, we have a constitutional monarch who rules in conversation with the Senate and who puts the Republic first. He's not a king, he's a first citizen. He's the leader of the Senate, he's always talking about the Senate. But then you look at this gleaming monument, all covered in marble and gold, with the gilded statue of Augustus himself on top, and you are overawed by its scale. It's almost monarchical. It is like the monument of a Hellenistic Greek king, like Alexander the Great. Those are indeed two very different Augustuses. And it's on those two Augustuses that I want to focus today for the next 45 minutes or so. You see, with Augustus and the imperial image, we're dealing with two forms of com public communication. We are in fact dealing with two images. On the one hand, we have a very humble communication of a Republican statesman. Augustus in his raised guest eye, in his own autobiography, repeatedly emphasizes that he restored liberty to the Roman Republic after the civil wars, that he got his power because he was elected as consul and elected as triumvir. And he repeatedly emphasizes the powers that the Senate decreed, the powers that the Senate gave him, not the powers he took for himself. But then we have another type of communication. We have a monumental communication on a grand, luxurious, monarchical scale. We have this vast tomb complex. And those are two very different images of the emperor. And broadly, over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to be telling you about both of those different dimensions of Augustus's imperial image. Now, when you've studied the imperial image of Augustus to this point before, you've probably been looking at sculpture. You will all be familiar, most likely, with the Augustus of Prima Porta, slightly larger than a life-size sculpture made sometime after 20 BC. We'll talk more about it later. And this is one of our most famous examples of Augustus and the imperial image. But one of the things that I'd like us to do this evening is also to move our focus away from sculpture and consider the many other ways in which Augustus as an emperor communicated his image to the public, to the people, to the army, and also to the Senate, because these were all different interest groups that the Emperor Augustus had to communicate with. So in what ways did Augustus communicate his imperial image, apart from merely sculpture? Well, naturally today, we're going to be talking about sculpture, but also I'm going to be showing you examples of Augustus's coinage, for example. These are an essential means of building a visual language that communicates with people, putting out Augustus's um, propaganda about his regime and his self-justification. We're going to be talking about the raised gestae a bit more later. Fundamentally, it's an inscription. It's not a work of literature. It is an inscription up there in public for everyone to see. It's Augustus' own record of his achievements. That also is an imperial image. We'll be talking briefly later about speeches. You probably haven't considered Augustus' public speeches as an example of his imperial image, but these are an essential way that the Augustan regime communicated its ideology to the public. Briefly, we'll talk about literature as well, naturally Virgil's Aeneid, which many of you will be familiar with, and that too forms an essential part of Augustus' image. We're even going to be talking about clothes, clothing and accessories even, uh, insofar as we can talk about the Romans having accessories, are an essential way in which the emperor communicates his personality to the Republic. So my basic point today is that it's a mistake to look for the imperial image of Augustus. We are in fact dealing with imperial images. At the very least, we are dealing with two main images. We're dealing with Augustus' constitutional image, the image he wants to present to the Senate and the aristocracy. But we're also dealing with Augustus' image as a mass consumption thing, right? In his dress, in his speeches, in his games, in his gifts to the people, in poetry. This is also an image for public consumption, not just for the Senate. 
So today we're going to be talking about all sorts of images of the Roman Emperor Augustus and thinking about how these made his rule successful. Broadly, by the end of this, I want us to have a sense of how Augustus used all these different types of communication, all these different types of images as a way of cementing his power. Augustus achieved something that his adoptive father, who we'll talk about later, Julius Caesar, could not achieve. He turned the Roman Republic, an aristocratic republic managed by the aristocracy, into a monarchy managed by himself. He survived and it worked for 40 years. He's the longest reigning Roman emperor for several centuries after this. So how did all these different images contribute to solidifying his position and keeping him safe? I also want us to broaden our definition of what we mean by an image. Is this merely a case of physical appearance? Well, no, of course not. This is about Augustus' constitutional image as well. And there are many ways to construct that image that aren't merely visual, but include also the things that Augustus says. And with reference to Caesar, third and finally, we're going to be thinking about what the, con the consequences are of getting this wrong. Why is image management so important for a Roman emperor? Well, the uh, predictable answer, of course, is that he could end up dead. We'll come back to that in just a moment. We can't get an understanding of Augustus' image and Augustus' reign without first thinking about Julius Caesar. It's impossible to form a good understanding of the causes for Augustus' success without first thinking about Caesar, his adoptive father, uh, and actually by birth, his great uncle. So I won't need to go into too much detail about who Caesar was. I know you'll already, already be familiar with him. But broadly, what we need to remember about Julius Caesar is that he was first and foremost a warlord. He was a Republican general and politician who reached the top of the political system in 59 BC. He became consul, that is to say, president, so to speak. There are two consuls who share the presidency of the Roman Republic. At this point, when Julius Caesar reached the peak of his power, or almost the peak of his power, Rome was a republic, which means that it was managed collectively by the aristocracy, by the Senate, who were here pictured uh, not being very nice to Caesar, in their white togas. Caesar's great achievement, or from his perspective, his great achievement, was to overthrow the Roman Republic and to rule as dictator. Now, after Caesar became consul, head of the government in 59 BC, he spent eight years fighting in Gaul, modern day France. He had with him several legions of Roman soldiers. A legion is anywhere between four and a half and 5,000 men. And these men became fiercely loyal to Julius Caesar after fighting with him in Gaul for eight years. Many of you will also have heard about Pompey, Pompey the Great, the other great general and warlord of the Roman Republic in the 50s BC. And the relationship between Pompey and Caesar broke down to such an extent by 50 BC, that in effect, the two of them were at war. And for the Roman Senate, this is an extremely difficult time. They couldn't force either Pompey or Caesar to stand down their legions and make peace with one another. So both Pompey and Caesar end up at war and the Senate end up dividing. Most of the senators end up taking Pompey's side, a very difficult fact for Julius Caesar, and a small minority of very intransigent senators take Caesar's side. With the assistance of his loyal veterans, Caesar crosses the Rubicon River in 50 BC and he enters Italy with his army. This was an illegal and almost religious crime uh, as an act, and he marched on the city of Rome itself. To cut a long story short, he defeated Pompey in battle at the Battle of Pharsalus in Greece in 48 BC. And Pompey was subsequently assassinated after he fled to Alexandria. So by 48 BC, Julius Caesar is on top and he had himself made dictator. Um, that is to say, um, essentially supreme governor of the Roman Republic. But a dictator could only rule for six months. And that's important. We'll come back to that point later. Why does all this matter? Well, Caesar had an image problem. And that's the crucial thing to remember 
if we want to understand Augustus's success. You see, Caesar allowed power to go to his head. Our literary sources, like Suetonius in his life of, of Julius Caesar, or Cassius Dio, are quite clear about this. Cassius Dio tells us the following about Julius Caesar's approach to governing Rome as dictator in the 40s BC. He says, I'm gonna quote, a gilded chair was granted to Caesar and a costume that the kings of Rome, like Romulus, had once used. And he was also given a bodyguard. When he showed himself pleased with these honors, the senators voted that his golden chair and his crown set with precious gems and overlaid with gold should be carried into the theaters in the same manner as those of the gods. The senators did this because they wished to make him envied and hated as quickly as possible so that he would be killed all the sooner. So you see, according to some of our literary sources, for Julius Caesar's brief tenure, four years, as dictator of the Roman Republic, Caesar had an image problem. He wears the clothing of a king. He has a gilded chair. He has a crown. He even allows his chair, when empty, to be carried into the theatre as if he were a god. But the Senate voted him this because they want to get him out of the way. Most of the senators hate Julius Caesar. He's had to forgive them for fighting against him during the civil war with Pompey. They thought they were siding with the Senate and with the traditional order and with Pompey. They wanted to oppose Caesar and eventually, after Caesar defeated Pompey, he forgave them and brought them back into the Senate. They still hate him. They want him to be murdered. Of course, we all know what happened next. Because of Caesar's image problem, ultimately on the Ides of March, the 15th of March, 44 BC, Julius Caesar was assassinated in the Senate House in the theatre of his great enemy, Pompey the Great. And it is said that Julius Caesar was stabbed multiple times beneath the statue of Pompey himself. It's an ironic and fitting end. The sources tell us that Caesar veiled his head with his toga. And of course, you know the famous line, et tu brute, which Caesar probably didn't say. It was probably kai su technon in Greek, and you, my child. But there we are. So for our ancient sources, and I think they're right about this, the assassination of Julius Caesar is partly a result of his image problem. He acts like a king. He accepted excessive honours too eagerly, too greedily. The fact that he did this humiliated the Senate. The Senate were the ones who had traditionally governed the Roman Republic. By taking on power and issuing decrees himself, by acting like a king, Caesar had insulted and embarrassed the Senate, the traditional locus of authority in Rome. Caesar was also the first Roman to put his portrait on the obverse side, that's the face side of coins. And to my mind, it is no coincidence that within one month of Caesar putting his face on the obverse side of the coin, he was assassinated. Our first coins with Caesar's head on them come from February 44 BC, and he's assassinated a month later in March. So you see, he's behaving in a truly kingly way. Even during his consulship during, in 59 BC, when he was essentially president of the Roman Republic, he repeatedly ignored the Senate's advice and he went over and above their heads. In 59 BC, when Julius Caesar was president, he was supposed to be sharing power with another politician called Bibulus. He refused to do that. He went over Bibulus's head and some sources tell us he even used violence and intimidation to bully the Senate into doing what he wanted to do. There's also the problem of Caesar's office, of Caesar's power. Caesar never called himself king. He may have acted like a king, but technically his position of power was dictator for life or dictator perpetuo. Now that's a contradiction in terms. A Roman dictator is an emergency official, an emergency magistrate who can take on power for six months in a crisis. Six months and dictator for life do not sit well together. It was a sheer contradiction in terms, but it's because Caesar had no way of defining himself, you see. After he had defeated Pompey and put himself at the head of politics, there was no way for Caesar to describe his power. He couldn't call himself king. That's a good way to get himself killed. So he called himself dictator. And that's quite an important point that we'll come back to a little bit later. 
Many of you probably know also about the events that followed the assassination of Julius Caesar and how Augustus rose to power. After Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, the Caesarian party, or the faction of Julius Caesar, was taken over by Mark Antony, his second in command. And many of you will also know the love story of Mark Antony and the Queen of Egypt, Cleopatra. The relationship between uh, Julius Caesar's adoptive son, Octavian, later Augustus, and Mark Antony gradually fell apart. Over the 40s and the 30s BC, the future Augustus and Mark Antony tried to share power. It didn't work. It's a long story. It fell apart. And the two of them ended up clashing at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Now, with the exception of a, uh, of, well, Pompey's son, Sextus Pompey, who I won't talk about because we don't have time, when Augustus defeats Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium in 31, that is it. The main body of resistance to his power is gone. And then Augustus is free to reign supreme and reign alone after the year 31 BC. Mark Antony and Cleopatra are out of the way. Many of his political opponents likewise have been dispatched, usually violently, and Augustus is on top. It's Augustus alone after 31 BC. Now, where does image come into this? Well, what's interesting about the, the years immediately after the Battle of Actium is the strategies that Augustus used to solidify his power and keep the Senate on side. And this is where the question of image is absolutely crucial. You see, our sources tell us that in the years immediately after Actium, Augustus deliberately pretended to relinquish power, to surrender power in a technique known as recusatio imperii. Recusatio imperii literally means a refusal of power. Cassius Dio gives us a speech of Augustus, which isn't genuine. It's not Augustus's own words. The historian Cassius Dio has composed this speech for Augustus, but it matches very closely many of Augustus's actual self-presentation. It's a good match with lots of the things Augustus said about himself in the Res Gestae. What did he say? He stood up in the Roman Senate in 27 BC and declared to the Senate, I shall lead you no longer and no one will be able to say that it was to win absolute power that I did these things. I give up my office completely and I restore everything to the Senate, the army, the laws and the provinces. Thus, my deeds will prove to you that even at the beginning, I desired no position of power. All I wanted was to avenge my father, cruelly murdered, and to free the city from the great evils and wars that have constantly plagued us. This passage is important for several reasons. As I've mentioned, it's a very close match with the way that Augustus presented himself in his Reis Gestae. For example, Augustus claims that he only took up arms, he only fought against Mark Antony because he wanted to avenge the murder of his adoptive father, Julius Caesar. It also matches very closely what we know about how Augustus did indeed behave with the Senate. And this is to decline power and decline uh, honours wherever possible. That's an immediate contrast with Julius Caesar, whom our sources depict as very eagerly and greedily accepting honours, no matter how extravagant that they were. Augustus himself tells us in his Reis Gestae about many of the occasions when he undertook a recusatio imperii, when he deliberately turned down power. For example, in chapter five of his Reis Gestae, Augustus tells us about a severe famine in Rome during, in the year 22 BC. Now, what you need to understand is that for a city of Rome's size, the grain supply is crucial. By 22 BC, there are probably about up to one million people living in the city of Rome. It's the largest city in history up until Victorian London. So the grain supply is absolutely crucial. Italy cannot supply the city of Rome with the amount of grain that it needs. Most of it gets imported from Sicily or from Egypt, which are the two bread baskets of the Mediterranean and the Roman Empire. 
The grain supply was failing. And in 22 BC, the people burst into the Senate house and they grabbed Augustus and they fell to his knees. And according to Augustus, they begged him to make himself dictator so that he could save them. And many of you will already remember now the Caesarian parallel here, the parallel with the career of Caesar. But Augustus tells us something quite interesting here. He says, in that crisis, I quote, I did not accept the dictatorship offered me by the people and the Roman Senate in my absence and later when present. When there was a great scarcity of gain, I did not refuse to take care of the grain supply. And so within a few days, I freed the people from danger of famine at my own expense. However, when the consulship was then offered to me, I did not accept it, either yearly or for life. This note is very important because it's a characteristic aspect of Augustus's image especially his image vis-a-vis -vis the Roman Senate and the aristocracy. Recusatio imperii, or refusal of power, becomes a characteristic of Augustus's reign. It's one of the ways in which, unlike Caesar, he wishes to show to the Senate that he doesn't want to arrogate too much power himself. He doesn't want to make himself a king. He just wants to be the first among equals, right? Yes, we might slightly wink there. It's significant that he refuses the dictatorship. By this point, the dictatorship had been legally abolished. After the assassination of Julius Caesar, the Roman Senate voted that there would never again be a dictator at Rome. So Augustus cannot make himself dictator because it reminds people too much of Caesar's arrogance and Caesar's um, kingly uh, and megalomaniacal um, predilections. Note that Augustus does tell us that he was happy to accept the charge of the grain supply. In the middle of the passage, he says, I didn't refuse to look after the grain supply. But he's very clear to tell us there that this was necessary and it enabled him to free the people of Rome from danger at his own expense. What he's telling us here is that he, as curator of the grain supply, bought a huge supply of grain from his own money and distributed it to the people to save them from famine. And the final part of the passage is also interesting. Even after declining the dictatorship, and saving the people of Rome from famine. When he, was, uh, when he was offered the consulship, he refused it. He refused to take on more power. He's working very, very hard to show the Senate and the traditional aristocracy of the old Republic that he is not a Caesar character. He has learned the lessons from the downfall of Caesar. And some of you may have already picked up here as well that Augustus is very keen to emphasize that he's being offered these powers by the people and by the Senate. Thus, when he mentions the dictatorship, he says, I didn't accept it even when it was offered to me by the people and the Senate. So you see, this refusal of power is an essential aspect of Augustus's image. What we get from Augustus' statements like this is the idea of a fellow citizen, not a king, a legitimate first among equals, a fellow senator, a fellow politician, just like the rest of the Senate. And actually that image bleeds into many other aspects of Augustus' self-presentation through all sorts of means and all kinds of archeological evidence. Take for example, this coin minted in about 18 or 19 BC. So this is what, about 20 years after the assassination of Julius Caesar. And this is about 15 years after Augustus defeated Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium. Note the obverse side, the face side of this coin, right? There, is no, there are no grand titles. All we have is an image of Augustus and then the name Augustus below it. He's not called Rex, king. He's not called Dictator, dictator. He's not given a, a reams and reams of titles. He has simply the name Augustus. And if you look at his portrait also, he appears like a typical Roman aristocrat. He's not wearing a crown. His hair is close cropped after the typical fashion of a Roman aristocrat. And he is clean shaven and we cannot see what kind of clothes he's wearing. He looks like one of us. This is what this coin is supposed to be telling us. If you turn to the reverse of this coin, that's on the right hand side of your screen, you'll notice this laurel wreath 
uh, an, uh, an oak crown, in fact, which was awarded to Augustus on account of having saved the citizens of Rome after the Civil War. And the inscription in the middle, known as the legend, in the centre of this coin says, Ob kiwes sawatos. Ob kiwes sawatos means on account of having saved the citizens. So this coin, which is a gold coin, it's an aureus, quite a high value item, is commemorative and it depicts Augustus as being an ordinary Roman, just like us, but not just an ordinary Roman. He is an ordinary Roman crowned with the oak crown, with the laurel wreath, to congratulate and thank him for having saved the citizens of Rome. For example, from famine and from civil war earlier on. So the impression that we get of Augustus from these kinds of images is that he possesses quiwilitas. That is to say, he has citizenness. He is citizen-like in his behaviour. His image is not a monarchical one. It is the image of an ordinary Roman aristocrat. And this image bleeds through into other types of monumental structure and other archaeological evidence that we see from the reign of Augustus. This will be very, very familiar to some of you indeed on your screen. This is the Arapacus Augusti, or the Altar of Augustan Peace. The Altar of Augustan Peace is essentially a sacrificial altar, uh, and it's dedicated uh, to the goddess Pax. Pax is the patron goddess of peace. And this altar was commissioned by the Roman Senate in 13 BC, and it was uh, completed and consecrated in 9 BC. And the purpose of this monument was to give thanks to the gods for Caesar returning, uh, Augustus Caesar returning safely from war. I want to draw your attention, though, to one relief in particular, and that's from the south side of the altar of Pax i.e. that's on the right-hand side on your screens just here. Because on the south side, on the south southern relief of the Arapakis Augusti, we have a depiction of the imperial family in a procession. Uh, most scholars tend to think that this uh, depicted procession of the imperial family is the members of the family proceeding up to the sacrificial altar to take part in a sacrifice. Some of the characters... Uh, on this frieze have been identified as specific members of the imperial family. For example, you can see a little child running in uh, among uh, the legs of the people around him and hand on his head. This is presumably Gaius or Lucius Caesar, um, who are planned by Augustus to be the heirs to the throne. Now, unfortunately, the relief of Augustus himself on this mon monument doesn't survive. Further to the left on the frieze, which you can't see on your screen, there is a gap in carving where many scholars believe that Augustus himself would have been portrayed. But we can get a sense from this relief of what Augustus might have been portrayed like in this relief. Note the kinds of clothes that the people in the imperial family are wearing. The boy, Gaius or Lucius Caesar, is dressed like any other young Roman aristocrat, he's wearing a kiton or a tunic and nothing else. The figure to the left of him, the older gentleman with his head veiled, is um, essentially fulfilling the function of a priest. He's wearing a toga, but he has his head veiled in the way of one, one of Rome's traditional priests. Likewise, the lady to the right of the child, um, dressed in a simple stola, uh, a stola, the, the dress of, a, of an aristocratic woman. The figures in this portrayal of the imperial family aren't godlike. They're not crowned. They're not wearing jewels and gold. They're dressed in togas. They're dressed in ordinary, everyday clothing. And we can imagine that Augustus himself would have been portrayed in the same way. Why? Well, naturally, the purpose here is to emphasise that Augustus is not a Caesar character. He is not a king. This is not a royal family. They are a family just like you and me. They are a senatorial aristocratic family who pose no threat to the Senate. And we even know from our literary evidence, like Suetonius's life of Augustus, that Augustus, in fact, dressed simply in his day-to-day -day life. And he even wore clothes made at home for him by his wife and his granddaughters. Suetonius remarks, I'm going to quote this, the simplicity of Augustus's furniture and his household goods may be seen from the couches and tables that still exist, 
many of which are scarcely fine enough for a private citizen. They say that he always slept on a low and plainly furnished bed, except on special occasions he wore common clothes homemade by his sister, wife, daughter or granddaughters. His togas were neither particularly close nor full, his purple stripe, signifying his senatorial status, he's a senator, neither particularly narrow nor particularly broad. So when we combine this evidence with what we can see of the imperial family on the south frieze of the altar of peace, what we get a picture of is an Augustus whose image was very much communicated to the public, but especially the Senate, as being an ordinary citizen, dressed in homespun tunics, homespun togas made at home by his own family, not in the garb of the Roman kings, not like Julius Caesar, clad in red, which was a distinctively royal colour. Uh, red and purple were both regal colours, but red especially, um, because it was the traditional colour of the Roman kings. No, no, what we have here is a simple Augustus, a man just like us. And then we come back to the raised guest eye again. How does the message of Augustus' image in his day-to-day -day life, in his dress, his portrayal of his family, interact with the messaging of the raised guest eye? Well, it's very clear if you read the raised guest eye, the achievements of Augustus himself, written by his own hand, that Augustus is eager to emphasise that he is subordinate to the Senate and people of Rome. That is why, repeatedly throughout the Reis Gestae, Augustus mentions the Reis Publica, the Republic, and that's what he calls his regime. He doesn't call it a monarchy, he calls it the Reis Publica, the Republic, or the Commonwealth, if you prefer. He emphasises, as we saw at the start, how the Senate decrees this and decrees that. He emphasises that the people of Rome offer him power, but he declines it in Recusatio Imperii. We combine that with the other archaeological evidence and with our literary sources, and we see that Augustus is very eager to appear to be simply the leader of the Senate, not a king. And we can even see that in the kinds of monograms that Augustus applied onto his coinage as well. So this coin on your screen uh, is also taken from about 19 or 18 BC, a bit like our other coin. We once again have a portrait bust of Augustus on the obverse. Um, young, classically beautiful, clean shaven, but with the close cropped hair of a Roman aristocrat. And he's wearing an oak crown around his head. That's not a royal crown, an oak crown around his head symbolises that he saved the citizens of Rome. It's a civic crown, it's not a royal crown. And on the reverse, we have the monogram SPQR. If you look to the centre of the reverse on the right hand side, around the shield in the centre, in between the two, uh, the two laurel trees, SPQR, the Senate and people of Rome. Above and below it is the legend Caesar Augustus. So what we have here is a sense of Caesar ruling in partnership with SPQR, in partnership with the Senate and people of Rome. And this is an essential part of his image, his self-presentation, and ultimately his survival. So what we have here partly is a constitutional image. What we have, in fact, is a sustained pattern of communication across Augustus' reign, which emphasises his key willitas. Now, if you don't remember anything that I say in this talk, please remember the word, word key willitas, particularly if you're doing imperial image at A-level. What does key willitas mean? Well, it doesn't really mean anything in English. We can't really translate it. Key willitas means citizenness or citizen-like behaviour. It's the quality of acting like an ordinary citizen. And what's very clear from the evidence that we've seen, and many other pieces of evidence from Augustus' reign, is that key willitas, acting and looking like an ordinary citizen, is partly at the centre of how Augustus wanted to communicate his constitutional image. In particularly his relationship with the Senate, Key Willitas is at the centre. He's an ordinary citizen. He's not a king. He's a senator, just like the other members of the Senate.
And we've seen already the different ways in which that's, that message is articulated. We've seen his costume, his dress, he, he and his family dressed like ordinary citizens. We've heard some reports from what are alleged to be his speeches, where we know that Augustus made public statements, statements to refuse power, to decline power. We've seen the imperial family looking just like us. Even Augustus' title suggests that he's a, a constitutional equal, that he's just a senator. His formal title is Princeps Senatus. Princeps Senatus means leader of the Senate. In the days of the Roman Republic, the Free Republic, before Julius Caesar, the Princeps Senatus, or leader of the Senate, was the first person called upon to speak in debates in the Roman Senate. And that is the formal title that Augustus assumed as a way of explaining his role. Of course, it's a sham. Augustus is a monarch, but he's very careful to portray himself as being not a king, but the princeps senatus, the leader of the Senate and the leader of the res publica, the leader of the Republic. Above all, what we see from the res gestae is that this is a monarch who wants to make himself look subordinate to SPQR the servant of the Senate and the people of Rome. So this is one aspect, of, and a crucial aspect, in fact, of the way that Augustus communicated his power, the kind of image that he built. And we've seen the various different ways, the various different images that were necessary for Augustus to build that self-presentation. But there's another Augustus too, of course, and that's the Augustus of the Mausoleum of Augustus, which I started with. The Augustus of the giant rotunda with the gardens on top and with the gilded statue. This is a, a, essentially a monument for a dead Hellenistic king. This is similar to what Alexander the Great would have had for himself or a king of his similar stature. So how does that Augustus, the Augustus of the Mausoleum, sit with the Augustus of the Reis Gestae? the princeps senatus, the ordinary citizen. Well, one of the ways for Augustus to square that circle and make this work was to emphasize Julius Caesar's divinity. Many of you will recognize already this image, the Prima Porta Augustus. Some of you would have studied it also too. The Prima Porta Augustus is perhaps the most famous portrait of the Emperor Augustus and the most famous por portrait in the history of the Roman world. It has to have been carved after 20 BC because on the breastplate of Augustus, we can see the standards, the legionary eagles being returned from Parthia. Um, Parthia in the Far East. The legionary standards had been lost by Crassus in 53 BC, and it was a great triumph for Augustus, uh, particularly his propaganda campaign, to get these eagles back. So we know that this has been carved after 20 BC, and it was found in the 19th century uh, in the villa of Livia at Prima Porta in Italy, not so far outside of Rome. Some of you would have already studied this fascinating sculpture in some detail. And let's break down the way that Augustus' image works here. What's clear is that Augustus is no longer being presented as an ordinary senator or an ordinary individual. He's wearing the armour of a legate. So in other words, he's wearing the armour of a Roman legionary commander. Over his arm is draped the paludamentum or the commander's cloak. And with his right arm, he's performing a pose known as ad locutio. Ad locutio in Latin literally means speaking to someone or addressing someone. And so he holds his right arm up and he's addressing the troops. He appears here as the ideal Roman commander, dressed in the armour of a Roman legate with elegant folds of drapery and commandingly addressing his troops. But there's a little more to this than meets the eye, because what we have with the Prima Porta Augustus is not only a portrayal of Augustus in the guise of a Roman commander, but also as a hero or a demigod. Note that Augustus is barefooted in this sculpture. Now, no Roman commander would go into battle barefooted. That's a pretty good way to get a pilum or a spear in the foot. He's portrayed barefooted 
because in classical Greek and in Roman art, heroes and gods are characteristically portrayed barefooted as well. Augustus isn't claiming that he is a god, that would be quite dangerous, but he is giving himself the status of a classical hero by being, or a semi-divine being perhaps, by being barefooted. Note also, just to the left, at Augustus's right leg, we have a cherub. The cherubs, the little flying kind of piggy baby things, are of course the symbols of Venus in Greek Aphrodite. And many of you will already know that Augustus' adoptive father, Caesar, emphasised that his family, the family of the Julii, was descended from Venus herself. So this cherub, which is actually functioning as a support, it's holding the statue up, it's keeping it stable. This cherub reminds the reader of Venus and the associations of the family of Julius Caesar with the goddess Venus. This is essentially a way of Augustus communicating to the viewer, I am descended from the gods. Uh, my father and my line are descended from Venus herself. We know that Julius Caesar, in fact, built temples to Venus. Uh, we have a temple of Venus Genetrix in Rome, just outside the Roman Forum. And this was a very important part of Caesar's self-presentation and self-justification. But we also know that Augustus, in his imagery and his sculpture, worked very hard to emphasise that he was descended from a god. One of our coins from uh, the middle of Augustus's reign portrays a comet on the reverse with the words Divus Julius, divine Julius. This is referring, of course, to Julius Caesar himself. And this is a way for Augustus to emphasise he is sprung from a god, Julius Caesar himself. Julius Caesar was uh, effectively canonised um, under Augustus's regime. He was a mortal man. After his assassination, decades later, Augustus's regime had him made into a god. This is as close as Augustus could come to declaring himself a god also. And according to the Roman tradition, at the funeral games held for Julius Caesar, a great comet appeared in the sky. And the onlookers took that to be a sign of Julius Caesar's apotheosis, of Julius Caesar becoming a god. Augustus worked very hard in his imagery to push that impression of Julius Caesar as a god. It had the welcome effect, of course, of uh, justifying Augustus's regime also. So we see this comet, this symbol of Julius Caesar becoming a god elsewhere in Augustus's coinage also. Take, for example, this very early mint. This is probably from about 36 BC. So this is when, um, this is when, this is before the Battle of Actium, in fact. And we have Augustus on the left, bearded. In Rome, having a beard means that you're in mourning. You're grieving for a lost loved one. And the significance of the obverse or face side of this coin of Augustus from 36 BC is to elicit sympathy uh, among the public for the death and the assassination of Julius Caesar. But the reverse is, a, is even more interesting. Take a look. I've highlighted in red for you a temple with a comet on the front and beneath it the words Devo Yule i.e. divine Julius or godlike Julius. This is believed by scholars to be a genuine monument. It's the temple of Julius Caesar, which once stood in the centre of the Roman Forum. And it's the site where Julius Caesar's body was spontaneously cremated by the crowd at his funeral. So Augustus is working very hard in his imagery, i.e. in his sculpture, but also in his coins, to legitimise the memory of Julius Caesar, to emphasise that Caesar is indeed a god and therefore that he, Augustus, is the son of a god also. We can also find traces of this kind of monarchical, semi-divine communication in Augustan literature. Now, many of you are already familiar with the Aeneid and perhaps with book six, which is the journey of Aeneas into the underworld, where he meets his dead father, Anchises. And the prophecy of Anchises for the future of Rome uh, is part of the, of the significant aspect 
of Augustus's monarchical communication. Anchises says to Aeneas, I quote, direct your eyes here, gaze at this people, your own Romans. Here is Julius Caesar and all the offspring of Judas destined to live under the pole of heaven. This is the man, this is him, whom you so often hear promised to you, Augustus Caesar, son of a god, who will make a golden age again in the fields where Saturn once reigned and extend the empire. Now, even though this is an epic poem, sponsored by the Augustan regime, of course, Virgil was one of many poets who were writing during Augustus's lifetime and were sponsored by uh, Mycenas, by one of Augustus's advisors. Even though this is a poem, it has a lot in common with the imagery that we have seen from Augustus coinage and Augustus sculpture. What the impression that we get from Augustus coinage and sculpture is that the regime of Augustus is divinely favoured, that the line of the Julii, the line of Julius Caesar and Augustus is descended from Venus, but also that Caesar himself has become a god. And therefore, Augustus himself is semi-divine. Now, we know that Augustus isn't going to go so far as to imply that he himself is a god. That is a good way to get himself killed in the manner of Julius Caesar. It's important still to appear humble and respectful toward the Senate, to appear like an ordinary Roman citizen. But the Aeneid and some of the other evidence that we've just seen is all part of a pattern of near monarchical communication as well. It hammers home to the contemporary viewer that the regime of Augustus is blessed and is going to create, to quote the Aeneid, a new golden age. So we have two very different Augustuses. We have Augustus, the ordinary citizen, and we have Augustus, the son of a god, divinely sent to save Rome and to follow the legacy of Julius Caesar. What's clear from the reign of Augustus is that he worked very carefully to avoid Caesar's mistakes. You are never going to see Augustus sitting arrogantly in a golden throne wearing a crown or red robes. Instead, Augustus emphasised his key willitas, his citizen-like behaviour, and that's crucial to his survival. But even though Augustus worked hard to avoid Caesar's mistakes, he also put out a series of propagandistic messages to rehabilitate Caesar, to emphasise Caesar's divinity, and essentially to try to paper over the cracks um, of Caesar's legacy. The myth of Caesar becoming god, a god is essential for the survival of Augustus' regime. And it's a way of giving Augustus a semi-divine status indirectly and therefore impressing the masses of the people. The Senate will talk about uh, at the end. There is no one imperial image of Augustus and there is no one way in which it's articulated. We've seen lots of different types of evidence here that contribute to the imperial images architecture, coinage, sculpture, speeches, literature, dress. These are all essential. So if we can sum up and try to reach some conclusions here about who Augustus is and how his image works, we need, in my view, to divide it in two. We need to speak of Augustus and the imperial images, not Augustus and the imperial image. And there are basically two main parts to Augustus' image. The first is the image that Augustus wants to present vis-a-vis -vis the Senate. That image is one that emphasizes the fact that he's the first among equals, the first citizen or the first senator, the princeps senatus. The Senate were understandably anxious about being humiliated once more in the way that they had been under Julius Caesar. So Augustus's communication very clearly works hard to ensure that the Senate feel respected that the Senate are the ones calling the shots. Of course, they're not, but this is an important part of his self-justification. The second image that Augustus is working with is his popular image, his image among the people who adored Caesar. The common people ultimately were responsible for the creation of Julius Caesar's cult. We have an awe-inspiring son of a god image vis-a-vis -vis the urban plebs. And we see that in architecture, we see that in sculpture, and we see that in coins. Um, and the coins that we've been looking at are about a day's wages. So they're the kinds of coins that ordinary people would carry around with them. 
So we have two very different imperial images of Augustus. Now there is a tension between these two images. We may ask ourselves, how can Augustus be an ordinary citizen when he's with the Senate and the son of a god, on the other hand, when he's with the people? And we, uh, we have ample reason to accept, in fact, that there is a tension there. I think the important thing for us to take away is that ultimately both sides, the Senate and the people of Rome, felt that they were getting enough out of this. Augustus worked extremely hard to court the Senate and to pay them respect, or to pay them the illusion of respect, and to give them the, the impression that he was working with them. That ultimately was enough. And we have to remember that when Augustus came to power, Rome had gone through 100 years of civil war. Many members of the aristocracy had died. So collectively, Rome was exhausted after 100 years of civil strife and was ready for Pax, was ready for peace. And that is what the altar of peace that we saw earlier is ultimately all about. So despite this tension, this contrast between the two Augustuses that we have, it is a formula that ultimately works in solidifying Augustus's rule and keeping both the Senate and the people happy and impressed with him. On a closing note, I don't think we should be too idealistic about Augustus. People at the time were not necessarily convinced by his propaganda. And propaganda it is. Propaganda because it's a sustained series of communications. It's an organized system of communication with a coherent set of messages that are meant to be drummed into people. But many senators at the time didn't fall for it. And they understood what was happening. The Senate understood that they had lost their real power. But the illusion of their respect and the illusion of their power was maintained by the regime. And that was crucial for keeping the system stable. So let's not be too, um, let's not be too gullible with Augustus' propaganda. He wants us to think that his reign was divinely ordained. And he also wants us to think that he was just an ordinary citizen or just an ordinary set senator in the things that he writes. Naturally, we don't need to be convinced by that. And many audiences at the time weren't either. If you're interested in chasing up any more of this further, then there are some things that you can read. Um, Paul Zanker's book is the classic. Uh, on the power of images in the age of Augustus. It is really, really useful. And if you go on to do classics at university, if you're interested in Augustus, then Zanker's power of images in the age of Augustus is absolutely fantastic. If you're interested in the idea of Augustus as a citizen king, check out Andrew Wallace Hadrill. Uh, it's a journal article, but your teachers can help you find it. And if you want a really readable new overview of how Augustus transformed the Roman Republic into being a monarchy, and where Caesar fits into that too, check out Josiah Osgood's book, Rome and the Making of a World State. Um, and of course, I'm sure your teachers can share these slides with you as well, if you want to chase up any suggested reading. So thank you very much indeed for paying attention. I hope that this has been a bit helpful in plotting out some of the main ways that Augustus' image, or as I've mentioned, images works. And I'm going to pop into the uh, Q&A now to see if any of you have questions for me or things that you want to discuss a little bit. None yet, but we have some in the chat. Oh, fantastic. Okay, right. Plenty in the chat. So those who are in the Q&A as well, please do pop some questions in there. I'm really pleased to hear from you. Even if you've got thoughts, you can disagree with me if you like on some of this. Anything you want to say, pop it into the Q&A and we'll come right onto it. Okay, so some questions in the chat for us. Question one, um, are you tempted to draw parallels between Augustus image management and the methods used by modern leaders and politicians? This is an excellent question, of course. To what extent do modern politicians wear two faces as well? Oh, how surprising, two-faced politician. Who would have thought it? Um, one of the key figures I find, modern political figures I find, who manages to do an Augustus and to be two people at once uh, is in fact someone like Nigel Farage or Boris Johnson. What's clear from characters like say Nigel Farage or Boris Johnson is that they are very talented 
at having different images for different groups in a similar way to Augustus. So, for example, if you consider Nigel Farage's classic uh, behaviour, how many times have you seen Nigel Farage drinking a pint and holding a cigarette, right? And saying, I'm an ordinary guy just like you. When in fact, of course, we know that he is a multimillionaire and a highly educated individual. And people like Nigel Farage, I also think of Andrew Neil, will talk about the metropolitan elite. And they will say, I'm not part of the metropolitan elite. I'm not a multimillionaire. I'm an ordinary guy just like you. I love going down the pub and having a fag and a pine, blah, blah, blah. So I think that in fact, I'm very tempted indeed to come back to your question to draw parallels between Augustus image management and how modern politicians um, work as well. Uh, if you want to hear my take on Boris Johnson, I have a video on YouTube where I look at Boris Johnson's speeches, because this is another um, example uh, of a modern politician really getting it right, like being two people at once. That's very much the current prime minister. He's excellent at being chill, cash, uh, using a bit of slang. But of course, we in fact know that he studied classics at Oxford and uh, he's a highly educated individual. And when he wants to, Boris Johnson can play up to his educated elite credentials um, as an old Etonian and various other things. Um, but he also has a popular and populist persona and Augustus mastered that communication as well. So yeah, excellent question. Absolutely. The, the recipe that Augustus is following, I think, is indeed um, one that's been very influential and that modern politicians use in our own time today. I've got a couple of questions in the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you very much for bringing these in. Right. Question one, how far would a Roman be aware of this fundamental contradiction in the image? Would that Roman visiting the mausoleum feel a sense of confusion at reading the humble raised guest die and then seeing the mausoleum in all its glory? Well, very good question indeed. I think your awareness of the contradiction as a Roman depends upon where you are. Now, if you are a member of the Senate, if you are a person who is deeply concerned with the prestige of the Senate and with your own power and the presentation of your own power, then I think this contradiction would be extremely visible. I think if you're at the centre of Roman politics, if you know how the system works, if you are deeply personally interested in the preservation of your own power and status, then you would see this for what it is, which is a hypocrisy, basically. And this is why I say that we shouldn't be too idealistic about Augustus. The regime is a massive con. I think the Roman Republic is exhausted. and I don't think it can continue with the civil wars of the last hundred years, but it is basically a huge con. Um, it is a huge sleight of hand. And I think that the Senate ultimately were prepared to go along with it because their status, their pride um, was ultimately retained and protected. So I think for someone like that, for a senator, the fundamental contradiction in these two images would be very, very, very clear indeed. For the ordinary people of Rome, which are a different constituency that Augustus has to appeal to, I think it's a little bit different. To be honest, we know that the majority of people in the city of Rome lived in quite appalling conditions. Um, we know that housing was extremely cramped. We know that uh, epidemics of malaria were, well, endemic, in fact, endemic malaria every year with the flooding of the Tiber. And we also know that Augustus was very proud of working hard to solve those issues. So, for example, Augustus introduced Rome's first building regulations to say that blocks of flats couldn't be too high or too cramped. And Augustus also um, worked hard to restore aqueducts and to dred dredge the Tiber so it wouldn't keep flooding so that the seasonal malaria would stop coming. To be honest, I think that as an ordinary person in Rome, your perspective is very different to that of a Roman senator who can see this contradiction. I think bread and circuses has its purpose. I think Augustus is keeping the people sweet with gifts, with grain, with direct gifts of money, with bribes. That is what these are. These are bribes. And I think ultimately, when you combine how grateful the masses of the people are, and how distracted they are with bread and circuses, and the sheer misery that they live in, 
I don't think they're thinking too much about that fundamental contradiction. Um, it is a conundrum. I think the Senate are fully aware of this. They're not idiots, they know, and they have the time to think about it. But I think they're too exhausted and happy to be surviving um, to care too much. As for the common people, I don't think they're giving it too much thought. Um, some excellent questions coming in here. Okay, question two. Do you think that some of Augustus' actions were genuine and not just to create an image of himself, but to actually act in the interest of the people? This is an excellent question, and this is such a struggle for us as ancient historians, because all we're working with is the scraps of evidence that we have. And of course, for Augustus, we have a great deal of evidence. So were some of Augustus' actions genuine? <sighs> This is such a difficult question because it involves us trying to read Augustus's mind. I think that Augustus genuinely believed that the Roman Republic didn't work, i.e. the old Republic, the Republic of the people before Julius Caesar, where the aristocracy share power. I, and I think that actually he's very similar to Caesar in that respect. The chief dif difference between Julius Caesar and Augustus is that Augustus is very careful to not repeat Caesar's mistakes. In a way, we need Caesar to happen for Augustus to succeed. Augustus, in my view, would not have succeeded if it hadn't been for Caesar making these mistakes with his self-image. I think both Caesar and Augustus saw the political system and they saw that it didn't work. I think that both of them perceived that radical change was necessary in both that the system needed to be reformed root and branch. And so I think both Caesar and Augustus took an opportunity. And we have to remember that many of the common people were thrilled with Caesar and Augustus's reigns. It wasn't the common people that assassinated Julius Caesar, it was the aristocracy, it was the Senate, because he was stealing their power. The people themselves, our literary sources tell us, were very disappointed at the death of Julius Caesar. They were very angry indeed, and they created his cult. It's a popular cult. And so I think also, in addition to recognizing that the political system doesn't work, Caesar and Augustus did believe perhaps that what they were doing could help the common people of Rome as well. Um, there is a great deal of informal bribery in the form of gifts, donatives, bread and circuses. But I do think that for Augustus and Caesar, they could convince themselves that they were doing right in two ways. One, they were saving Rome from itself. They were saving Rome from the catastrophe that was the Roman Republic, which couldn't go on. Urgent reform was needed. And I also think they genuinely believed they were helping the people of Rome. So that's a great question. I don't want to be too cynical about Augustus. I think first and foremost, this image management is very carefully planned. But Augustus doesn't want to follow Caesar's path. He doesn't want to die. And he could. He really could. He could have been assassinated too, um, given the way that he'd stolen power from the aristocracy, the traditional senators. But I do think that he did believe that he was doing what was best for Rome, and he was saving the Republic from itself and saving the citizens from a miserable life of starvation as well. So thank you for that question also, because it invites me to be a bit less cynical about Augustus. And I think in those two ways, Augustus believed that some of his actions were genuine and he genuinely wanted to make things better. Question from Rebecca Jones here, question three. Do you think the people of Rome cared for Augustus' reign? Or were they apath apathetic toward it, like many are toward politics today? Oh, um, cult is one of the best. I partially answered this, I think, in the previous, um, in the previous question, but very briefly, Cult is one of the important ways that we can see this. I do think that the people of Rome cared for Augustus's reign. And by the people, we mean the common people, of course. The populus Romanus, the people, is the aristocracy as well. But when we talk about the people, let's focus on the common people. I think that the events of 22 BC are a way of us seeing that the common people of Rome did appreciate Augustus's reign in general. Um, for a crowd, for a throng, to beg Augustus to make himself dictator is quite radical. We only see it a few times in Roman history prior for a crowd to apparently spontaneously beg for an individual to assume 
great power, dictatorial power. I, I think that what this shows us, the love of the people of Rome for Augustus, uh, and they're begging him to assume more power, it does show us that his propaganda is working, basically. So do I think they cared for his reign or not? I think his reign was beneficial for them. I think that Augustus was very generous with the cities of Rome. He gave them very large gifts and he worked hard to make their lives better in many ways. So yes, I do think the common people of Rome did care for Augustus's reign. And one of the ways we can see that is the way that they spontaneously try, apparently try to give him more power um, on their own initiative, which he very wisely declines. He doesn't need more titles. He already has absolute power. Um, okay, uh, a question from Jackson. To what extent did the public image Augustus created endure past his death? Oh, wow. I mean, enormously. This is an excellent question, Jackson. I wish I had had time to talk about this um, in, the, in the lecture itself. So Augustus creates the, the benchmark, the model for how you be a successful image builder, for how you be a successful communicator of your image. All Roman emperors after Augustus are going to be judged according to Augustus's standard. So if you read Suetonius or you read Dio, or to a lesser extent Tacitus, because he's a bit more cynical, certainly Suetonius and Cassius Dio, the criteria of evaluation for a good emperor is Augustus. And we talk about the system that Augustus created, the political system created, as the principate from our word princeps, i.e. princeps senatus, leader of the Senate. Uh, and at one time, scholars used to um, talk about the principate, which is the regime of Augustus, the Augustan way of ruling, and the dominant, which is a way, which is a much later phenomenon of, of Roman, Roman emperors being tyrants and kings. It's not a legitimate approach anymore. We don't really use the term dominant anymore. It doesn't really work. But certainly the system that Augustus created endures, and these patterns of communication also last for a very, very, very long time. Augustan communication, particularly key willitas, the idea of citizenness and ruling with the Senate, really becomes a benchmark. And future generations, uh, so Suetonius 100 years later, Cassius died 200 years later, would look back on Augustus and would use him as the benchmark for two reasons. First, because he's the first Roman emperor, but secondly, because I think they think he got it right. And his media of communication, coins, inscriptions, autobiography, sculpture, monumental architecture, um, speeches, interaction with the Senate, all of these ways of building a public image remained central as well to the communication of monarchical power for hundreds of years afterward. So definitely, Jackson, excellent question. The public image that Augustus created did endure and subsequent generations were convinced. In our time too, we are still convinced. When my students come to me in first year, having studied imperial image, they sometimes believe that the Augustus of the Reis Gestae is Augustus. And that's because Augustus controlled the narrative. That's because Augustan propaganda was so effective um, at building a coherent ideology and a coherent message. So you could say that the public image Augustus created resonated and lasted not only through Roman history, but actually to the present day, because generations of students still find Augustan propaganda convincing um, and are tempted to be quite sympathetic to him because he controlled the narrative. He built a whole propaganda campaign, which we still have. Do we have time for one more question, Alex, or do I need to wrap up? Um, I think if you, uh, I think that's probably enough. I think that's probably, there are lots of excellent questions I know, and it'd be good to, to, to go through all of those. But, um, but thank you to all of those who have asked such good questions. And uh, a special thank you on behalf of all of us listening to Dr. Bernard Strevens for giving such an amazing and interesting talk on Augustus. Um, and also um, showing us how important it is to get the propaganda right if we want to win support and hold office, um, but not in an overtly self-glorifying way, um, but a way in which uh, it, uh, that distances us from those that have made uh, earlier mistakes. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Dr. Burden-Strevens, uh, for everything you've uh, spoken to us about tonight.
it showed Augustus in a, a new light for me um, and, and for many of our, uh, your listeners as well, I think. So thank you. Thank you thank also you. to all of those who have attended t tonight's talk uh, in the Guildford Classical Association area. Um, and hope to see you at another Guildford Classical Association event soon. Um, uh, information about which will come to you by email shortly. So thank you to everybody um, and um, thanks for listening and see you at the next event. Night everybody.